Thank you. Thank you. So, ladies and gentlemen, that makes me sound terribly boring, doesn't it? Um, barrister, judge, what on earth am I doing here? Well, what I'm going to talk to you about today will affect every one of you, especially if you have an AI business or are thinking of starting one. So listen up and follow well. You see, that's the professor coming out of me. Um, so why a magic wand? Well, I thought I'd give you something to look at and think about whilst I tell you a little bit about what I do. So what I do is I work with governments, businesses, civil society, and academics across the world, thinking about governance of artificial intelligence. That's governance with a small g, because we all know that regulation doesn't really fit the bill for artificial intelligence. But we also know, and I'll fill it out a little bit more later, that there are some problems in AI that we really need to be thinking about. So that's the work that I do, and I'm going to tell you more about it because it will affect all of you. So either regulation will come to you, which I hope it doesn't, or some of these soft governance things will come. And whilst we think about soft governance at the World Economic Forum, we think about soft governance as enabling as well. And I'll explain that to you. So the wand. Well, it seems to me, and as I say, I have conversations across the world. In the last month, I have been to Cape Town, Colombia, India, Moscow, Geneva, and now here. And so that really is pretty global. Um, and so what I hear is governments thinking, oh, AI, that's the thing that's going to get us out of the mess that we're in at the moment. It's this sort of mythical, magical beast that's going to cure everything from climate change to healthcare to you name it. And yet we in this room know that it's not necessarily going to do that. So what happens when we get tech clash? What happens when the hype doesn't actually stand up to what we can actually deliver? So that's why I felt that this metaphor of a magic wand was really important. Because if we all go back to our Harry Potter, Harry, the, you know, you could use the wand for good or the wand for evil. That's just dual use technology, even though it's mythical. But with AI, you have something slightly different from that. You also have those of us who really want AI to succeed, and we're trying, but still things go wrong. We only have to perhaps ask Chris Wiley about that. So what we, can we do as a community, and what do I do working together with that community to make sure that we succeed with AI and we don't go back into another AI winter. Well, I want to take you back into ancient history for AI, or at least for this particular um, uh, cycle of AI, because I've been thinking about AI and ethics since before it was popular, since the time when it was me, the dog, and a few other, others of us on the phone together, or actually, I guess, on social media together. But um, just back in December 2015, 12 of us came together and with the IEEE and said, we should do something. We should write something about AI and ethics. And we did. And by April of 2016, there were 80 of us. By August of 2015, there were, sorry, 2016, there were 120 of us. When we produced this latest document, that was 2,500 people working around the globe on this topic called AI ethics. And I am told 
that um, this is a top trend for 2020. This is what we're going to be talking about. So we've come a long way since December 2015. We also had this meeting at Azilamar, which some of you will know, um, in 2016. Um, that the pictures me, Margaret, Francesca Rossi, Wendell, and Hugh, Hugh Price, thinking about what are the ethical principles that we should put in place for AI. It was the first of many. You can't now go anywhere without having ethical principles thrown at you. Well, what are we supposed to do with all these ethical principles? Let me talk about some of those issues. So, as I, as I say, I'm head of um, machine learning and artificial intelligence. I work in governance and policy space. We have centers in San Francisco where I work, India, China, Colombia, and the United Arab Emirates. And um, we're expecting 20 more around the world in this coming year. So the idea is that we think about these topics with governments and businesses, civil society and academics around the world. And these are the areas that we're particularly interested in. To make that concrete for you and to bring it right back here to the United Kingdom, we have been working for the last year with the UK to help the UK to think about procurement of artificial intelligence. You may know if you're a startup that it's really difficult to sell to the UK government. So what we did was we helped them to write procurement rules for artificial intelligence. So you may have read in the paper in September that, um, there, that we have now announced these high-level rules. And we've also written a workbook because there's no point in giving um, civil servants, procurement officers, um, high-level guidelines without telling them how to apply it. So that's the work that we've done with the UK government. But just because we've done it with the UK government, we've tested it with the UK government, so the Ministry of Defence, the Home Office, the Ministry of Justice, and the Ministry of Transport. It will come into effect in January, which is why I said, you have to listen to me because this is actually going to happen to you. So it will come into effect in January. So if any of you are going to sell artificial intelligence to the UK government, you will be caught by these regulations, or not regulations, these guidelines. Why did the UK want to do this? Is it strange? Well, the UK wanted to do it because they wanted to fix the problem of not being able to buy AI from startups. They wanted to grow the AI economy because that's where the startups come in. And they wanted to draw a line in the, ha in the sand so that they would say, well, this is where we would regulate. So everybody get on board with this level of ethical AI. And because we're the World Economic Forum, we now have 15 other countries that are going to adopt these regulations too. So even if you're not working with the UK and you're working with a different government, then they're going to be applicable, they may be applicable to you. So Singapore took a different view. If you are um, working in AI in Singapore, you're going to find that the Singaporean government want you to um, cert look to certify the, eth the AI models that you're using in your work. And they're actually going to set up a certification scheme. Again, something that we did with them. You may know, or you may not, you have, how many of you got children, small children? Yes, okay, how many of them have got AI-enabled <laughs> toys? Mm, not so many. Okay. All right. So you may have thought about this. What does giving AI-enabled toys do to your kids? How do they learn creative play if all of their, if all of their toys have backstories already? Um, how do we educate our kids using AI? These are some very big issues about what the future of humanity looks like. So we partnered with UNICEF 
to try and come up with some, some understandings and some guidelines, um, for example, with a toy company like Lego, to really think about these deep issues about of what human beings were creating for the future. So um, that's another piece of work that we're doing. The responsible limits on facial recognition, given that we're in the King's Cross area, might be of interest. Um, this is a project that we're doing with the government of France to really think through how much France needs facial recognition and surveillance for terrorism and crime and things, and how much it, civil liberties it wants to retain for its, for its people. So really important project, likely once we've done it, if we can prove that it works to actually roll out across Europe. And then reimagining the regulator. We're told, aren't we, all the time, innovation, regulation, they don't mix. Well, maybe they need to, maybe we need a different regulator. A regulator where you can innovate and you can also be protected as citizens of the world. And then in India, the Indian government wants to create an overarching ethical framework for everything that's done around AI. So we've been asked to help them do that. And for your boards, lots of boards don't understand technology. They don't understand AI. So what we did was we created a toolkit. It has 12 modules. And um, each of those modules is applicable to something that a member of the board does. We think it's really important that as well as politicians being educated, boards of directors are also educated. C-suites are also educated because otherwise it's going to be really difficult for those of you who are startups to actually sell into these companies that don't actually know anything about the technology that you're trying to sell. So when I was in Colombia, um, I was talking to the ICT minister and she said, looked at me and she said, well, a board of directors for a country, that would be council of ministers and the president, wouldn't it? And I said, well, maybe. And she said, OK, come back. Two hours, we'll give you two hours, come back and we'll learn about AI with you. So I think that it's really important that we also start continue this education from uh, boards of directors to politicians around the world. And that brings me to our thought leadership. So we've been thinking about this. One area that people have only just started to really think about is um, patent law. I'm a lawyer, so of course I think about these sort of things. But I think it's going to be something that will really trend coming up this year. And as I am about out of time, I want to invite you to work with us. Every one of you could join our work. Every one of you could be part of the community that actually helps us shape the future of AI and the way that we want it to, build, to be built for the benefit of our world. So, Bring us a project, or collaborate on something, or just listen to us and, and help us out occasionally. Or send a fellow to work with us for 18 months in San Francisco on one of these projects. So, with that, I will say au revoir and thank you for listening to me. <laughs>